Well, there are a few different ways in which Christians approach culture, the arts, the music, entertainment, movies. We can ignore it. We can try to isolate ourselves from it, create our little Christian bubble and stay away from it. We can maybe imitate it and just create a Christian version of everything, slap a Bible verse on it and call it Christian, or we can think well about it. We can see what sort of cultural ideas are out there, see what nuggets of truth we can find, and then use that to make connections with people. I think we saw the Apostle Paul do this at Mars Hill where he took artifacts and truth from what he saw in that culture, but drew them to the truth that it was revealing, pointing them to Jesus Christ. And so that is our conversation today of how can we think well about our culture, the arts and entertainment? How does the arts and entertainment, your favorite movies, point back to God, reveal Jesus and the gospel? That is the conversation. To do so, we're going to be looking at this new book, Hollywood Heroes by Frank Turek and his son, Zach Turek. So first, Frank, thanks for coming on. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Ryan. I'm bringing an audience with me. There you go. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Wow. Well, we have a, a lot more people here, watching than normal. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, Frank, as many of you uh, know, is the president of crossexamine.org, uh, well known for his book that he co authored on. Uh, how- I don't have enough faith to be an atheist and gives that presentation all over the place. And so, Frank, this is a little bit different than what you normally do, maybe, of just kind of an apologetic showing an argument for the case for God. How did you get into this idea or this topic of movies? Well, my son has always loved movies. My my eldest son, we have three sons. And uh, I don't know, it must have been five or six years ago, we just got talking about so many of the movies that he saw and a lot of the books that he read. He read a lot of books growing up uh, that were turned into movies. And uh, at one point, I just said to him, hey, Zach, there's so many parallels here to the Christian story, we could probably write a book. Right. Now, he has gone to Southern Evangelical Seminary like I have. He already has his uh, master's degree in philosophy there, even though he's in the Air Force. Uh, he's a major in the Air Force now. So he's been studying while he's been in the Air Force. And for the past few years, we uh, uh, start again, stop again, start again, wrote this book, Hollywood Heroes, How Your Favorite Movies Reveal God. And what we go, what we do, as you know, Ryan, is we go through a number of uh, probably the most popular superhero fantasy movies over the past three or four decades. Movies like Captain America, Iron Man, Harry Potter. Harry Potter. I know Christians go, "Oh no, Harry yeah. Potter!" And we You're can not talk about watch that, that movie, Frank. Yeah, I know. <laughs> There's Star nothing good Wars, in Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Batman, Wonder Woman. Um, we we have some in there about Superman, a little bit about Spider Man. So we. We cover a lot of those franchises and we point out that so many of them in some way, actually all of them in some way are stealing from the greatest story ever told. So we can get yeah. into it as we go. Now, I'm pretty sure I think I saw Sean McDowell interviewed you on this book as well. Uh, was he upset that you did not include Spider-Man as a chapter? I know that is his his favorite. Yeah, I know. We did. Uh, <laughs> we, I said he, he, Spider-Man didn't quite make the cut because we really didn't have an, enough material, new material for Spider-Man. And uh, we do talk about him, though. He's in the intro chapter because something that happened in his life is a good lesson for us. So, yeah, Sean, Sean had, to, <laughs> had to deal with the fact that Spider-Man wasn't, isn't prominently displayed in the book. Yeah. My favorite superhero, actually, is Iron Man. Uh, so maybe we can okay. talk about that a little bit. But We will get to Iron Man here in a little bit. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I think as, as we kind of... Uh, uh, discuss this. I want to kind of, kind of maybe come back to how I started because how I teach my students and, and the approach I want to take is say, look, you know, I don't want to just ignore it. I want to, I want to engage with culture. I want to think well about it and how to draw those connections. And so, kind of, how do you see? You mentioned how these favorite movies often steal from a biblical view. Uh, can we kind of start out maybe in a big picture of like how? Kind of, do you have advice or thoughts on how we as Christians can be engaging with Hollywood? Where, where do we need maybe to stay away or, or how can we use this well kind of in gospel apologetic conversations? What does that look like? Yeah, first of all, let's all ad- admit what we already know. There's a lot of garbage that comes out of Hollywood. We all know <laughs> that. But that doesn't mean there aren't good things that come out of it either. And so we've tried to highlight the good that has come out. And we've noticed that just about every one of these movies that I mentioned earlier, these movie franchises, they deal a lot in sacrifice, Ryan. Sacrifice. That's what resonates with people. There's evil that's going on, and someone has to come in and sacrifice him or herself to save those people from evil and to bring them to the promised land, which is essentially the story of Christianity. There's got to be someone that's going to come in and sacrifice take the hit for us so we can so he can ultimately take us 
to heaven. And that's, of course, the story of Jesus. Really, actually, what he does is he brings heaven to earth, as we all know, but you you, you get the idea. And yeah. uh, so sacrifice is critical, which goes completely against our culture, right? Our culture is now all about me, me, me. You're, you have to... You have to yield to me. I'm never going to sacrifice for you, right? I've got to follow my heart. I've got to, I've got to, I've got to follow my dreams to the point where everybody has to agree with me. And if you don't agree with me, I'm going to hammer you, right? I'm going to call you names. I'm going to say that you're wrong. I'm going to say you're evil if you don't agree with whatever dream I want to follow. That's not, of course, the Christian viewpoint. The Christian viewpoint is God comes to earth and he sacrifices for us. And we're saved by simply accepting what he's done for us. Right. And, and we, we recognize this. And so I'm kind of curious as, as we look at this, I mean, there's, there's aspects that we can see in these movies, right? That, that talk about what a hero is and to talk about this. And, and there's something that resonates with us in that. And I know there's kind of two different approaches where someone might come along a skeptical person and say, well, yeah, we just have this kind of this, this story that we like about the hero that conquers the day and saves it all. And the Christian story is just another one of those made up myths that just the hero mm -hmm. conquers the day and saves it all. There's, there's nothing true about that. It just is a, a nice story we listen to. So why would you say that this is actually stealing from the Christian story versus the Christian story is just another one of these made up stories like everything else that we're seeing in Hollywood. Uh, and there's no reason to believe that either. Well, as you mentioned, our book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, points out why the Christian story is the true story. And we do have a bunch of apologetics in the book, Hollywood Heroes, Ryan. It's woven yep. through uh, the chapters. But it reminds me of something we have in the introduction when uh, J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis were friends before C.S. Lewis was a Christian. J.R.R. Tolkien, who, have, as you know, wrote Lord of the Rings, uh, said to Lewis, you know, Lewis, you're, you're Jack, that was what they called him, Jack, you know, you're, you're enthralled with all of these mythical stories about uh, dying and rising gods that most of these came after Christianity. You're enthralled with them, but you're not enthralled with the true myth. The true myth is the Christian story, which actually did take place. And why are you not interested in the true myth? And it got Lewis thinking. And as you know, Lewis ultimately became a Christian and then became probably the top apologist of the 20th century because he checked into the evidence and realized Jesus did, did rise from the dead. So the Christian story is not just another story, as Tolkien put it. It's not just another myth. It's the true myth. This one really did happen. And so we have some of the evidence for that in the Hollywood Heroes book. And of course, we have much more in the book. Uh, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Yeah. Now I'm curious, kind of with, with that, you know, we, we, you, you cover superheroes here in this book and, and you kind of mentioned before of like the culture is kind of shifting where instead of you first, it's me first. And there seems to be this like disconnect where we recognize that the true hero is the one that sacrifices right. and, and gives <laughs> up for others yet at this. And uh -huh. we love that and we're drawn to that, but at the same uh -huh. time, we don't do that ourselves. And so I'm curious as you were writing this, if you kind of had processed that with your son of like, where is that disconnect for what we see on the screen and recognize as a hero to what we actually live out in our everyday life? Yeah, it, we could all be indicted by that, right? We're the yeah. me generation. We're not into theology, we're into meology. You know, whatever I want. I'm going to change the scriptures to suit me. I'm going to assume that God agrees with everything I do and God has to adjust to my sexual preferences or or my relationship preferences, or whatever I want to do with my life, rather than the other way around. So, yeah, that's one of the issues that uh, we bring out in the book Hollywood Heroes, is we point out that what really resonates with an audience, Ryan, is not selfishness. It's not follow your heart. What really resonates with an audience is when somebody sacrifices himself to save somebody else. Yeah. That's when people go, wow. They don't go, wow, when some guy chickens out and just is in it for himself. They go, that guy's a snake, right? right. <laughs> the audience really gets excited when somebody gives up what he wants to do in order to save somebody else. Right. Yeah. The person example after example of that, if you want. Yeah. When the person runs and hides in a corner out of fear, mm -hmm. we're not like, wow, mm -hmm. look at how amazing they are. So, so kind of here <laughs> at the right. very beginning, you know, if you can kind of spell this out a little bit, like we talk about Hollywood heroes and we have this kind of picture of a hero. Uh, how would you define kind of what is a true hero and how is that kind of taken from a Christian view? 
Yeah, well, of course, the ultimate hero, the last chapter of the book, Hollywood Heroes, is Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. And while some of the other heroes that we cover in the book, whether it's Captain America, Iron Man, uh, whether it's Wonder Woman or Superman, whoever else we cover, we say they have qualities that uh, maybe they have some of the qualities that Jesus has, but Jesus has all of the qualities in a perfected way. That's someone who's going to put others above himself. That's a hero, someone who is going to sacrifice his own well-being or his own life to save somebody else for the right reason. And that's, of course, what Jesus does. And that's, of course, what all of these Hollywood heroes do. They're yeah. willing to sacrifice. And uh, when we get into Iron Man, I'll give you a, a prime example of this. Iron Man is, is a lot more like you and me than it is uh, than he is other uh, superheroes you see in, in the book. That's one, of, that's one of the reasons he's one of my favorites. But the real point that we're trying to get across here, Ryan, is I know there are parents watching right now who um, – are going, you know, how do I get my kid? My kid really loves movies, but he's not really that all interested in Christianity. He's not really all that interested in God. Well, why don't you take what he loves in a movie or she loves in a movie and say, man, if you love Harry Potter or if you love Iron Man or if you love Lord of the Rings, man, you're going to love the Christian story. Right. You're going to love Jesus because Jesus is the perfection of all those characters. And the difference, of course, is that Jesus is real. Jesus is true. And Jesus came to save you, not some somebody on the big screen. He actually came to earth to save you. And so you can use this book, Hollywood Heroes, especially now around the holiday time, to get your kids a little bit more interested, hopefully a lot more interested in the true hero, the ultimate hero, and that is Jesus of Nazareth. Well, yeah. And there's deeper questions, right, that can come out with that. It's like, okay, you know, son, you love heroes. What about the hero do you love? Mm -hmm. And where do you get that from? Where, where, like, mm -hmm. why, why, Frank, is sacrifice a good thing? Yeah, well, Jesus said there's no greater love uh, than when someone lays down his life for his friends. He said that, of course, he went before he went to the cross. And I don't care if you're an atheist. When you see that, you go, that's noble. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's That's true love. That's something where you sacrifice yourself to save somebody else, there can't be any higher form of love than that. Yeah. And that, as I said earlier, that just resonates with people. Follow your heart and do what's ever on your heart, regardless of the moral consequences, is not inspiring to people. It yeah. doesn't resonate with people. We may say we want to do that, but when we see somebody doing that, we go, you're selfish. You know, you're, yeah, we, you're somebody I don't want to emulate. Yeah, we know when it. You, yeah, yeah. When you see somebody actually sacrifice himself or herself or someone else, we're 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 moved by that, rightfully so. Yeah. Now you have a lot of conversations with students on college campuses. Uh, you do this quite frequently, and I'm just curious, kind of like, what sort of responses have you gotten from them? Because in a in a secular framework, in a naturalistic worldview, uh, one in which morality is relative and a very popular idea in our culture, like how do we make this case that that sacrifice and heroism is actually objectively good? Or are there a lot of students who are saying, no, it's just something we like, but there's not actually anything inherently good about it? Yeah, actually, I think a lot of students who are not Christians or not theists, maybe they're atheists, they don't have a coherent worldview, as you know, Ryan. They um, don't realize that their worldview cannot support what they also believe is true, and that is it is love really is right and murder really is wrong. They, they think love is right and murder is wrong, but they just can't justify why love is right and murder is wrong, unless God exists. So they don't recognize that their atheistic worldview does not afford them with these moral values that they already believe in. They kind of, they kind of have a worldview that's, conf that's contradictory. On one hand, they believe in objective moral values, especially the, the popular ones, right? Like it's right. wrong to, you know, it's, they may think they have a right to say abortion. They think that's a right, for example. Um, and then you say, well, is that just my opinion? You're no, it's my, it's my right. Okay. Where do you get rights from? Yeah. Okay. Rights don't come from people. Rights come from God. Do you think God wants you to abort your child? You know? Yeah. Uh, it, otherwise it's just an opinion. So on one hand, they think they have rights. On the other hand, many times they're atheists and they can't put those two things together. Yeah. Yeah, it really makes no sense within a naturalistic worldview of why something like sacrifice is good. It seems to go against 
evolution and, and what, you know, exactly. we're, if we're trying to allow for the survival of our species, you can mm -hmm. maybe try and argue that for me to sacrifice myself would help the species survive, but there's no moral obligation on that. Maybe I'll kind of jump to that a, a little bit, um, you know, because I'm just following my thoughts and I'm thinking ahead way now. But, uh, you know, I was reading in like your Star Wars chapter, right, of this idea of the force. Um, there's mm -hmm. no moral obligation to a force, but we recognize Mo there's kind of this moral obligation in the world that we have where there are objective moral duties, things that we should and should not do. So kind of how, how do you kind of tie that into a Star Wars movie and, and recognizing kind of this force in our and morality? I know you drew from that. Yeah, well, we said that on one hand, George Lucas says that Star Wars is a morality play, and it is, right? It's good versus evil, the Jedi versus the Sith, right? It's it's Luke versus Darth Vader, and Luke wants to redeem his father. Oh, sorry, spoiler alert. Uh, Luke, Luke, Luke wants to redeem his father, Darth Vader, right? These are all themes that are going on through the movie. Um, and we asked the question right in the chapter in Hollywood Heroes on Star Wars, how do you have an obligation to a force? And the answer, of course, is you don't. I don't have an obligation, say, to obey gravity. Neither do you. You know, right. if you go, go and try and dunk a basketball, you're not sinning against the law of gravity. Okay. <laughs> so, um, how does how is morality accounted for in Lucas's kind of pantheistic world? And the answer is, it isn't. It's it's a movie. He doesn't have to connect all the dots, right? He doesn't have to be logical everywhere. It's supposed to be fantasy. But isn't it interesting that when you go to the theater and you sit down or now you watch it on your TV, you automatically know who the good and bad guys are, right? Yep. Yeah, you, you already know that the Sith are evil and the Jedi are the good guys. So the audience brings a moral compass to the movie, even though in that movie there is no objective ground for good or evil because there is no god that is a personal god to whom that to whom you are you are obligated to obey right yeah and i think this is such an easy way and if we're really engaged with the culture and the entertainment we're thinking well about this we can hear people that that make moral demands uh, it's common <laughs> or people that are revolting and and protesting things in culture recognizing immorality and it, immoral behavior and we go okay how do you how do we account for that because it's something that people recognize they know that there mm -hmm, are objective mm -hmm. moral duties and things that are actually right and things that are actually wrong and it's the christian worldview that makes sense of this and so you know i think that's you know kind of the connection for those students is as people watch these movies and go wow what they did was good okay why mm -hmm. was that good right? right and i ask my students this you know so sacrifice right that's what makes a hero why is sacrifice a good thing Mm -hmm. How do you explain that upon your worldview then and make a case that sacrifice is good? And so you talk about that of this idea of the, there's no objective grounding for morality if there's just a force. Now, kind of going back, you know, you, you talk about it as well, and then I'll get to some of the other superheroes um, about this idea of kind of this longing for another world, right? Not only are a lot of these, almost all these movies are this fight between good idea, uh, good and bad, but also this longing for another world, um, you know, maybe another world that we're actually made for, and that, you know, and that, that we're and we're realizing something true is, that is true. C.S. Lewis kind of teased on this a little bit as well. Could you go into that of this idea of how you get us longing for another world in these movies? Yeah, as C.S. Lewis has said, as you pointed out, that if I have a desire for something that this world cannot satisfy, uh, then the best uh, the best explanation is probably that I was made for another world. Yeah. And we all know that we can have great relationships, we can have great jobs, we can have great homes and great comforts and great causes here on earth, but we still all recognize something's missing, Ryan. I mean, even the best relationships, even the best jobs, even the best situations lack something where we have a void and we know that there's something beyond this world something transcendent that can satisfy us even though we can't reach it here fully right. and that's what lewis was getting at we have yeah. these little glimpses of heaven when something happens in your life and you go wow that was amazing and then it's fleeting it's gone you're back to reality yeah. um and lewis is pointing out that there's something in us that says, this isn't enough. There's something beyond this. And of course, the scriptures say, God has put eternity on our hearts. Augustine famously said that uh, we, our hearts are restless till we find our rest in you, God. 
Uh, and all of these movies demonstrate the human condition in some point, to some degree. Every one of these movies has a problem. Otherwise, it wouldn't be an interesting movie, right? <laughs> uh, you know, okay, uh, uh, Captain America runs into problems. Uh, Iron Man runs into problems. You know, the Thanos wants to take out the the evil or wants to kill half the population and later he wants to kill everybody and start over, right? These are all problems that have to be dealt with because things aren't just right. Um, every movie that we look in has a problem and everybody's longing for a solution. Now, we love being taken from a place of evil, pain and suffering to a place where we can live happily ever after. Yep. That's what these movies do for us. In, a, in an artificial way, but that's, of course, ultimately what Jesus does for us. Yeah. We are bound here by a bondage to decay. We know things aren't quite right. We get sick, we die, we, we, we have heartache, we have pain, we have suffering, and you read the second to last chapter of the Bible, there's not going to be any more of that. God's going to come back, save us, create a new heaven and new earth. And the only question is, are, have we accepted the gift that he's provided for us? If we yeah. have, we'll be with him. If we don't, we'll be quarantined in a place called hell. Yeah. Yeah, these movies are so such clear pictures of revealing mm -hmm. uh, to us the broken fallenness of the world and, and, re and revealing this desire we have deep down where we want that evil to be stopped and we want mm -hmm. to live in a place where there is peace and wholeness and love. And the Christian worldview actually satisfies that problem. There's a real problem and there's a real solution and Jesus right. can actually satisfy that. And we, we see that and that, as you point out here, it, it there brings out that longing in us for this. Mm -hmm. and we can use that to have spiritual conversations with people, man. Why do we have that deep longing in us for this world? And do you actually want the real solution or do you just want to watch movies that excite you about having a solution, but is not actually real in the real That's world? Right. <laughs> it's all make believe, right? Yeah. I, yeah. yeah if, if, if you love some of these movies because, you know, they live happily ever after, well, it's not just a movie. It's it's real life. Yeah. Yeah. They're taken from the true story of reality. Mm -hmm. I want to read a section here. I don't often do this when I interview, but uh, there was two mm -hmm. paragraphs here that I thought were so good on page 15 in your introduction. Mm -hmm. He says, whether you say whether on the big screen or in real life, we are naturally drawn to those who exhibit courage, self-control, wisdom, justice, faith, hope and love. We intuitively know those virtues make them heroes. No one ever mistakes a coward double-crossing selfish cheat for a good guy, even if he occasionally does the right thing. All of this assumes that human life really matters, that there's a right and a wrong way to treat people. There's a true purpose to life and an ultimate desti destiny for all of us. That's actually the Christian worldview. And this is why mm -hmm. I wanted to have you on to talk through this is because that's what I'm you know, trying to communicate is if we're thinking well about entertainment, we see these virtues and characteristics in our culture and we can try to pull that out to then draw people to say, think about how this is actually makes sense within this view. And so I think that is so good as we recognize these about the movies. So as we then jump in, you said your favorite superhero is Iron Man. Frank, why is that? Well, think about Iron Man. He's a lot like us um, in the sense that he's got flaws, right? He's not like Captain America who doesn't really need much moral development. You never have to worry, is Captain America going to do the right thing? No, he does the right thing all the time. That's why he's <laughs> Captain America, right? But Tony Stark is a billionaire, playboy, amoral arms dealer. Uh, Ryan, you would think he has everything to make him happy, right? The big three that we talk about in the book quite a bit, and even the scriptures talk about this, the big three things that we think are going to make us happy, sex, money, and power, right? Yep. If we could just have enough sex, money, and power, we got it made. We're going to be content. Well, Tony Stark has all of that, and he's still miserable, right? He's got everything to live with and nothing to live for. He doesn't have any purpose. That's his problem. He doesn't know what, what what's this is all, what, what life's all about. He's got everything he thought he wanted, and he's still, still not content. And so what happens? One of the weapons, as you know, uh, that he sells to a terrorist blows up near him, and it puts shrapnel in his chest, and he has to have a device installed into his chest in order to guard his heart from encroaching shrapnel. If that device fails, he dies. Now, I don't know if the movie writers intended this or not, Ryan, but for me, this is a beautiful picture of what I think is the second most important Bible verse in the entire Bible for today's culture. The first has to do with the gospel, obviously. The second, though, comes from Proverbs 4.23, which says, 
above all else, guard your heart because everything you do flows from it. Notice it doesn't say follow your heart. It says guard your heart because everything you do flows from it. And what does Tony Stark do? He begins to guard his heart. He begins to figure out what's really right and true. And ultimately, he goes on this character development arc, Ryan, where he starts out as a guy, you'd say, this guy's never going to be in a hero. He's in it all for himself. To the point where at the end of Endgame, spoiler alert, <laughs> he is the one that actually sacrifices himself to save the world from Thanos. Yep. Now, to show you how why this is inspiring and why the cultural follow your heart isn't inspiring, imagine if at the end of Endgame, instead of Tony Stark sacrificing himself to beat Thanos, just before he was about to battle him, imagine Tony Stark, Iron Man, turns to his buddies and he goes, guys, I'm just not feeling it today. I don't <laughs> think I want to take on Thanos. In fact, I got to get back to following my heart and taking care of just me. I'm out. And then the movie ended. Would anybody go, wow, what a great film. Wow, that was inspiring. He turned what a Taylor hero. Rain out of his heart. <laughs> you know, we'd, all, we'd all go, that's selfish snake. Why did he do that? That's not inspiring. And yet the culture is telling us to do exactly that. You just follow your own dreams. Don't worry about anybody else. Don't let anyone tell you what you, you can and can't do. You just do what you want to do. That's not what Tony Stark does. Tony Stark realizes he's here to save the world, and he does, even though it costs him his life. And that's what Jesus does for us. Yeah. Well, and, you know, there's so many just fascinating moral dilemmas uh, between uh, Avengers Infinity War and Endgame to talk mm -hmm. through of not only asking the question, OK, why is Thanos bad? Mm -hmm. Right. Because what he's trying yeah. to do is to help the flourishing of humanity. Right. He's going to wipe out half the planet. So there are enough resources for everybody else to truly mm -hmm. flourish. And, and we hear that argument made all the time of, hey, there's not enough resources to go around. How do we limit or restrict human population to make sure we, we have enough resources. And this comes up in environmental conversations a lot of, mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. often it's restricting or killing or eliminating or somehow inhibiting human, you know, effects because we are the poison. We are the problem. Um, rather than recognizing, no, that's not how you help us is by killing half of us. <laughs> the, <laughs> well, and then, think about this though, Ryan, that's exactly what Hitler said absolutely. he was trying to do, right? He's trying to get rid of the undesirables so the super race, the uber race, can flourish. Because these undesirables are taking resources away from the uber race. Right. Now, you don't get what Jesus did. You don't get that from a Darwinian uh, morality, right? Of course, there is no morality on atheism. But and, and Richard Dawkins, who's the top atheist in the world, most recognized anyway, to his credit, he says, I don't want Darwinian morality. Right. I don't I don't want survival of the fittest. So to his credit, he realizes that the problem is, if there is no God, why not go with Darwinian a viewpoint of morality or go with what Hitler said? Because there is no objective right or wrong. Whoever has the most power wins. Right. See, and that's that, that's what these movies can show you, that whoever has the most power is not the most righteous necessarily. You yeah. need somebody to come in who's going to sacrifice himself to save you. And all these movies do that. Yeah. And that's I just covered a similar idea in my worldview class with my students of recognizing in a Darwinian view of life, uh, you know, evolution does not select based on truth and also does not select based on what is right and wrong. It selects right. on what is strongest, what is most powerful. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. ask my students, how do you see this in our culture today? How do you see the same idea where it's not necessarily we're searching after what is true or what is moral, but who is the loudest, who who causes the biggest problem, who kind of big, caused the right. biggest ruckus? And, and there's a lot uh -huh. of examples that they were able to see of this. And so we see that uh, definitely in Thanos. And there's other ethical issues of end of life issues, early life issues, where we see this idea of, oh, hey, there's not enough resources. Maybe we can, you know, advocate for something like a euthanasia, or, you know, because, hey, they're just taking up resources. Well, um, think about this, too. Uh, let me just uh, add on to something you just said there. No extra charge for this. This is really the reason or one of the reasons for cancel culture, uh, because if you if you don't if you can't argue on principle, if you can't reason your way to your position, what's your only other option? If you can't get there on principle, the only way you can get there is via power. So what you do is you shut down the opposition. If you can't go toe to toe in an argument and win the argument and show good reasons why your position's right, what you're going to do is just try and shut the other person up. That's where cancel culture yeah. comes from. And yeah. if there is no God, there is no ultimate right. That's all you got is power. That's the problem. 
Yeah. Yeah. So it's how do we as Christians get back to this understanding of recognizing and showing and advocating for objective truth, objective morality, and how we are called to live and what is actually right, not just Mm -hmm. what works in that sense. Now, you know, the other kind of big moral dilemma is not only why is Thanos an evil villain for caring about humanity and wanting them to flourish, but then there's also the moral dilemma between the movies, right? Where where in, in Infinity War, it's can you sacrifice someone else in order to stop Thanos. So is, you know, can Scarlet Witch kill Vision or can, you know, uh, Starler kill Gamora, whatever it was, or, uh, you know, I think it was Thor to kill Loki to destroy the stone to stop Thanos. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then that moral dilemma switches where in the second movie, it's not, can I kill someone else to try to save everyone, but sacrifice myself. Right. right. And we talked about that in, with Iron Man. And what does Captain America say about all that? He goes, we don't trade lives. Yeah. You notice that? that that was his position. Yeah. So we don't trade lives. Yeah. Yeah. They wanted to maybe kill vision or have vision set. Cause if you, if the infinity stones are destroyed, then Thanos can't do what he wants to do. And they said, right. nope. so they look, it sets up all these moral dilemmas. These are great. Um, these are great things to think about for kids yep. Yep. and even young adults or adults to say, you know, how, what do you do in this situation? Yep. Right. You got a dilemma here. And so Absolutely. it, it's great moral. So in the book, Hollywood Heroes, we not only have, obviously, the movies we're talking about, we have apologetic insights on how this points to the Christian uh, truth, the, the truth of Christianity. We have theological insights and also these ethical, philosophical issues that we deal with. In fact, when we, we talk about Batman, as you know, um, there's there's a, a movie, Batman versus Superman, in there, Ryan, where one of the greatest theological questions ever is explicitly stated in the movie. (laughs) It's a central part of the movie, and that is if there is a good God, why does he allow evil in the world? And that's that's addressed right right in the movie, and of course we unpack it in the book too. Yeah, absolutely. Now in the Iron Man chapter as well, you you talk about this idea Mm -hmm. and you ask the question, does the suit make the man or does the man make the suit? And Mm -hmm. you, you know, the kind of presenting this idea of everything is achievable to technology, better living and robust health. And, and, you know, we finally achieve world peace through technology and we realize that is also not true. Uh, that the technology will overcome everything. There's still this miserable, you know, Iron Man is miserable and all this kind of stuff. But then you you make this kind of comment as well, or this connection of science and technology. Mm-hmm. And, and you, you make this idea of can science tell us or science can tell us how to make a bomb, but it can't, science can't tell us whether we ought to use that bomb, right? Morality mm-hmm. is not something we find in a test tube. So here's another one of those ethical connections that you make to this, to these movies of it talking a lot about, about, you know, the technology that we have and, and this advances in science, but there's still a lack of how the bomb is made versus should I use this and how should I use this? What is a good and bad way to use the bomb? Uh, so is there anything else that you want to kind of go into there of, of kind of making this connection, helping people see of how, yeah, science can tell us a lot but it really is lacking when it comes to things like morality. Yeah, well, as we point out in the book, science doesn't say anything scientists do, yeah. right? See, the scientist has to gather the data and then interpret it and then decide whatever he's gathered and whatever he's interpreted, if he's invented something new, how it ought to be used. Because science, as you pointed out just a second ago, is amoral. You don't, You can't put morality in a test tube. So... We can figure out how to build a bomb, but are we going to know whether or not we ought to use it? That's not a scientific question. That's a philosophical, ethical question. Right. And if there is no God, there's no right or wrong answer to that. Only if there is a God whose nature is good, is and, and therefore he created us in his image, and therefore people are, are valuable, do we then have a moral obligation not to do something that would take the innocent life of innocent human beings. Yeah. Yeah. And so again, I think this is something that we as a culture, for most of us, we know deep down, whether we admit it and say it with our words is different, but we know this deep down that there's a way in which people should act. Mm -hmm. And that is not science, something that science can tell us. And so we hold this view that science is the ultimate source of knowledge. Um, You know, there is something that science can't tell us and it can tell us a lot, but it can't tell us how we should use things and how we should not. Now, Interesting. Uh, Let me just add on to that, because yeah. when, when people say, well, uh, all truth comes from science, as you well know, um, that's a self-defeating statement because that truth doesn't come from science, right? It's right. not a statement of science to say that all truth comes from science. It's a statement about science. It's a philosophical statement that can't be proven in the laboratory. Yeah. And as we point out also in the book that you can't do science without philosophy. Science is built on philosophy 
And in fact, everything we do is built on philosophy. You could, you could give a loose definition of philosophy, not just the love of wisdom, but right thinking about reality. We can't even read the Bible without philosophy or read something on the internet without having certain philosophical principles that we bring to the text to try and figure out what the text means. Right. So all of this presupposes uh, a philosophical or metaphysical, something beyond the physical reality, which now we're getting into the realm of God. Yeah. I love, you know, the William Lane Craig response where he's is an old debate where they're sitting on the couches and then uh, I think it was Peter Atkins or someone that says, you know, right. you know, are, are you saying that science can't prove everything? He goes, no, there's five things, you know, and he just boom, <laughs> yeah. boom, you know, beauty, aesthetics, morality. In fact, science itself, you know, mathematics right. is you have to assume mathematics works in order for science to work. And 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 to, to claim that, you know, science explains everything, it, it really misses out on all of those things that are not explainable by science including science. You know, if anyone is watching right now and you want to see that clip, I know it's on YouTube. If oh, you just is. if you just Google Craig Atkins debate, I happen to actually be at that debate, Ryan. That debate was in April of 1998. It was in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, I use that clip in I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist and even the Stealing from God book, I think, because it's such a great clip when <laughs> Atkins says, you don't deny that everything can be explained by science. And Craig goes, well, I do deny. Yeah. You know, in fact, logic if you ask, if, can't be explained by science. Math can't. Aesthetics can't. You know, history can't. Science can't. You know, he goes through these yeah. five things. And Atkins is just frozen there. Like, <laughs> you know what? And he's <laughs> like, if you would have brought this up in the debate, here's what I would have said. I was prepared for yeah. this, you know. Uh, I just looked at, yeah, and then I like the moderator at the end. He goes, uh, put that in your pipe and smoke it. You know, yeah, that was William F. Buckley. You're a little bit young to remember him, but he was <laughs> yeah. an eccentric conservative. And uh, in that debate, it was a riot because it started out this way because Buck Buckley was totally on Craig's side and he wanted to make sure everyone knew he wasn't going to be impartial as a moderator. Mm -hmm. He was a Roman Catholic, Buckley. And so when he introduced uh, Craig, he said, uh, representing the Christian position is Dr. William Lane Craig. And then when he introduced Atkins, he said, representing the devil oh, <laughs> is Dr. Peter God. Atkins. It was just, it was classic. Anyway, wow. they can watch yeah. that debate. Yeah, yeah I looked it up. I looked it up right here. Does science prove everything? That's from Dr. Craig videos, YouTube. And then there's another one. What science can't prove? Dr. William Craig explains to Dr. Peter Atkins. Now, uh, along with that, you know, one other thought that pops into mind. I know, uh, you know, I, I've had him on my show and I know you uh, have had to interview him many times, but uh, John Lennox, who I named my son after, um, is um, talks about this just simple idea of, you know, you walk into someone's houses and a, and a you know, pot of tea or you know, pot of water is boiling on the stove. You know, science mm -hmm. can explain that. And here's the molecules and here's why everything is bouncing around. And here's why the water is boiling. But then there's another legitimate question to why is the water boiling? Because I want a cup of tea. That's and, right. and there's yeah. a personal explanation to it. And there's a scientific explanation to it. Both are valid but, and give you different aspects of why that water is boiling. Uh, but not everything is scientific. Absolutely. That's right. Um, all right. So switching gears here, uh, the, the forbidden movie that you decided to address harry potter <laughs> let me start with this first paragraph that you mentioned here you say arguably there has not been a single fictional character in popular modern literature and film that has had more in common with the life death and resurrection of jesus christ than harry potter now, as Christians, we often love the Lord of the Rings series or whatever. And you say, yeah, the Harry Potter's story mirrors the life, death and resurrection of Jesus more than Gandalf from Lord of the Rings or even Aslan from the Chronicles of Narnia. Christians might go, what? More than Aslan, Frank? Mm -hmm. uh, so what are you trying to say here of how Harry Potter has more in common with the life, death and resurrection of Jesus than arguably any other fictional character in popular literature? Okay, put aside for a second, we'll talk about it after this. I know a lot of people are worried about the occult in the movie and all that. Okay, we'll get to that. But set that aside for just a second. Notice that Harry Potter parallels the life of Jesus virtually identically in this sense. Number one, he's prophesied to be the savior of his world before he's born, and an evil force, king, tries to take him out before he's, or when he's an infant. Does that sound familiar? Okay. <laughs> Secondly, he has to live a moral life in order to achieve him being the savior of his world. Thirdly, he then has to sacrifice himself, die in order to save his world. And then fourthly, he rises from the dead 
and his followers have to put their faith in him in order to ultimately defeat the Satan figure, Voldemort. That is a exact parallel to Jesus, and you know why it is? Because J.K. Rowling, who is the author of the whole series, said that the entire series can be epitomized by two Bible verses which appear in the books and the movies. The first is the last enemy to be destroyed is death, which is, of course, from 1 Corinthians 15. And the second is where your treasure is or your heart will be also from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And Rowling said, I never wanted to talk about this. I never wanted to talk about that these are British books and they're going to have a biblical worldview in the sense that that's what we're going to follow here. I never wanted to talk about this because I didn't want people to know where we were going with it. Hmm. Okay. So the parallels are direct because she's getting the story from the Bible, essentially. And you can, as we point out in the book, Hollywood Heroes, she's been interviewed several times on this. She points all this out. Now, of course, the occult gives Christians allergies to this, and I get that, okay? Uh, let me mention a couple things about the occult in the movie. I've noticed that Christians, uh, for some reason, have an allergy to Lord of the Rings, I'm sorry, to, uh, to uh, Harry Potter, but not to Lord of the Rings or the Chronicles of Narnia, which also have the occult. Yeah. Now, why is that? And I think maybe the reason is, uh, is because C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien were already known as Christian authors. When J.K. Rowling showed up, nobody knew who she was. Hmm. And like, can we even trust this person? You know, do, do, is, is, this, is this proper here? Um, secondly, a, a, as you notice, the occult in the movie, uh, of, or the movies and the books of Harry Potter, are not the kind of occult generally that the Bible talks about. The Bible's not talking about you getting on a broomstick and playing a modified game of, of uh, you know, of soccer in the air, whatever they call that game in the movies, right? Yeah. Uh, just like we don't think that in the Star Wars series, it's really true that you can levitate a spaceship with your mind. This is just <laughs> known as fantasy. This is made up out of J.K. Rowling's mind, just like it's made up out of George Lucas's mind, okay? Now, I will say this. If you in any way think your child would be encouraged to somehow get into the occult by watching any of these movies, whether it's Harry Potter, whether it's Lord of the Rings, whether it's, you know, Chronicles of Narnia or Star Wars, then fine, don't let them watch it. But what you ought to do, I think, is at least let them know the storyline. Why? Because their friends are probably watching it. And if their friends love these movies, this is an evangelism opportunity for you because you can point out or your kid, your kid can point out all the parallels from these movies to the Christian story. And if these kids love those movies, they're going to love the Christian story. Yeah. Yeah. And then you even mentioned that in the kind of the introduction to this part is like, yeah, sometimes we are uncomfortable with something, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and but how is it that maybe we can overcome that uncomfortability to use this to really make a mm -hmm. difference and to try to draw people to Jesus? And it's not saying, you know, we obviously are not advocating for doing sinful behavior in order to mm -hmm. try to witness to someone. Um, but, you know, if, if we are watching these other movies that we recognize, yes they have occultish things or they have aspects that we disagree with, but as a whole, they're showing some biblical principles or can be used to show that. And we're willing to engage with movies that have these other aspects to them. Then why not this? Why, why not and, here and be able to have that conversation? And think about any movie that is a movie between good and evil, Ryan, you know, thrillers, dramas. Um, the Bible itself is filled with good and evil. Yeah. Okay. The Bible is rated R, frankly, it's rated R, okay? You read some of the stuff in there and you go, wow, this is brutal stuff, right? It is rated R, should we read it? Well, <laughs> yes, yeah. we should read it. Now, that doesn't mean you have to read everything rated R in the culture, right. but I'm saying every, every struggle between good and evil is going to have unbiblical behavior in it by definition, okay? So the question is, does that mean we can't uh, in any way watch it or read it? And I think the answer is we can, but it's not always age appropriate, right? There's gonna be, I'm not saying every kid should, should watch any of the movies that we have in here. Depends on their maturity level, how old they are, and whether or not they're susceptible to some of the things that they might see in here. Right. Yeah. And, and with that, I think it's important. I'm kind of curious because, you know, I, I've heard um, John Stone Street at a Maven conference talked about how uh, his daughter 
wanted to go see the new Beauty and the Beast movie. And there was like a gay scene or something in that movie. And she's like begging yep. her dad, please, can I go see it? Please, can I go see it? And he talked about it. As a Christian parent, I have three options. Mm -hmm. I can either say, no, it's got a scene that I disagree with and I don't want mm -hmm. you to watch that and I'm not going to go watch the movie. He goes, that's fine if you want to do that. He goes, yeah. I can take her and hope it goes over her head that she doesn't mm -hmm. recognize it. Um, or I can take her and talk to her about it before and then have a conversation with her about it after and point out, hey, this is going to happen. Now let's have a conversation and let's allow this movie for me to have a conversation with my daughter on what we think as Christians and how we address these certain issues and how we love and, and to think well, because I think it's hard. In fact, one person uh, that, that messaged me back in, in, in me advertising this conversation of like, hey, do we ignore culture or do we think well and engage with it? And they're like, we well, can't ignore culture. It's in your face. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's impossible to ignore it. And it's like, well, there are ways in which I think Christians try to put ourselves in a bubble and ignore it. But then there's a way of saying, hey, I want to engage with it, but I want to do so thoughtfully and with our eyes open, pointing things out to our kids so that we can have those conversations about it. And I'm yeah, curious fact, if you kind of, oh, yeah. No, I was going to say, we, in the chapter on Wonder Woman, we point out that this is what Paul did on Mars Hill, excuse me, from Acts 17. Uh, he, he knows, quote unquote, the movies of his day in Acts 17, because right. in order to move people from their gods there in Athens to considering Jesus, he starts quoting the pagan philosophers, the Greek philosophers there. He is taking true statements from their world and applying it to Jesus. So, for example, in uh, the Greeks would say, in Zeus, we live and move and have our being. So what does Paul do? He takes that statement and he says, in Christ, we live and move and have our being. Right. Yeah. So he's taking what's going on in the culture and he's saying this parallels the true story. Yeah. This this is the true myth, so to speak. And so I think that's that's what we have to do as well. We have to show people when the culture is when something resonates in the culture to people, particularly sacrifice, we ought to say, bingo, why does it resonate? This is this is this is what we all desire. And it just so happens that somebody did come to sacrifice himself for you. Would you like to know more? Yeah. Well, and with that comes this idea of it's not just finding things that also resonate, but but also something that they see as authoritative, right? Mm -hmm. To where if we're just going to quote authorities, you know, they don't believe in the Bible, but we just keep quoting right. the Bible as our authority or whatever, then it's like, well, I don't accept that. What else you got sort of thing? But if we're able to say, okay, we're able to listen in that conversation, understand mm -hmm. them, understand where they're coming from. What are the things that you like and don't like? Okay, you love technology. How can I show how technology points to a mind and designer and creator of the universe, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Oh, you love movies. How can I show this? And so like, you know, that's, that's what I think, a, you know, a faithful, if you want to say faithful follower of Christ who really is engaged in thinking well about culture and, and wanting to engage the culture, we, we have the ability to do that. And there's times where we have this Christ against culture approach where it's like, no, culture is evil, stay away. And we want to be more like the Amish or something and create our own communities then how is it that we then love our neighbor if we don't understand our neighbor? That's right. We don't engage with them. Yeah. yeah. Have, have you heard of Oz Guinness's uh, spot the lie game that he plays with his kids? It's probably his grandkids now. Have you heard of this? I've heard other people talk about it. I don't think I've heard Oz Guinness explain it. Yeah, he basically says that when, if he was, say, watching something with his kid and he sees something, let's just take an example. He's watching a show and it, say there's premarital sex in it and there's everybody's happy. There's never any negative consequences with it. So he'll turn to his kid and say, what's the lie in this? And the kid, well, daddy, they're having sex without, you know, they're not married and everybody's happy and there's no problems. Exactly. In other words, it's a, it's a way to have a instruction, a moral instruction to a young person without sounding all preachy, without getting the Bible out right all the time. It's just yeah. saying, why is this wrong? What, what are they trying to sell you here? Can you see yeah. what's going on here? Right. And see if the, it, it, it makes the, it makes the child more discerning. It also uh, teaches a valuable lesson. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, and it's time is like where I cover my ethic, uh, my worldview chapter. I remember, uh, you know, students were like, I can't watch movies the same anymore. I'm like, you're welcome. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't want people to be selling lies to you and making them look convincing and that just kind of right. going past your mind and you just start adapting beliefs and ideas that are just blatantly not true that you can go, hold on a second. That's mm -hmm. not what happens. I know a lot of friends who have tried that and that's always worked mm -hmm. out wrong, you know, mm -hmm. and, and there's a goodness to having your mind turned on when you're engaging with entertainment. Not only does it keep you from falling to uh, captive right. to those lies, but then it allows you to better 
do what God has called you to do in making disciples and evangelizing and having those conversations because you understand people and then you can use mm -hmm. common references that relate. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, so when you kind of work through these, uh, we talked about Harry Potter. We talked a little bit about Star Wars, Iron Man. You briefly mentioned Captain America. I'm kind of curious when it comes to Batman. Uh, we have mm -hmm. a, just a, a little bit left, about 10 minutes or so. Um, what do you see as uh, being kind of maybe unique in Batman uh, that uh, kind of points to or reveals God from maybe the other superhero movies of sacrifice and that sort of thing? The most unique thing about Batman is he has, or that series has the most... Uh, the most realistic view of human nature. Hmm. Uh, notice that in Gotham, just evil is everywhere, and it doesn't matter how many bad guys that Batman locks up, he's got, there's another bad guy the next night he has to go lock up, right? It just never ends. He never wins. He can never take a break. And yeah. he's always fighting in the dark, right? Men love darkness rather than light. He's always trying, He's. it seems like he's fighting a losing battle, and he is. And the same thing is true in real life. We have uh, police and we have military to and government to limit evil. We know we're never going to completely eradicate it. We're just there trying to limit it. We're trying to uh, protect innocent people from evil by through government, through the military, through through police. Uh, that's that's what we're trying to do. And Batman depicts that better than any. And as I mentioned earlier a film that a lot of people didn't like, but man, that it really hit a big issue was Batman versus Superman. Uh, and that they address directly, if there is a good God, why is there evil? And so we cover that in the book, Hollywood Heroes as well. We talk a lot about evil and why would a good God allow evil? So we cover all that. Yeah, no, that's so good because yeah, that is the question. And I, when my why God allows evil talk, I always mention that of like, hey, you know, how do we deal with these different problems of evil? Because if someone comes up to you and just says, you know, why does God allow good things to happen to bad people? Right. As Sean McDowell always says, and I heard it, I think first from him, you know, how you respond first is of all the questions to ask about God, why that one? Mm -hmm. Because if the response is, well, I just found out yesterday my grandma was diagnosed with cancer. Right. The mm. response you're going to give is very different than if someone says, right. well, I was just watching Batman versus Superman and Lex Luthor yeah. says, hey, if God is all powerful and all good, why is there still evil in the world? And and if you respond intellectually to the person whose grandma just got di diagnosed with cancer, um, that's not going to help. And you're probably going to, you oh. know, hey, well, God has a plan for this, you know, buck up, you know, sort of thing. That's it's like right. you're going to you're going to get slapped <laughs> in the face. Cold. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to get yeah. slapped in the face and have your own problem of suffering. Um, but if you respond to the person who just watched Batman versus Superman and saying, hey, come here, just cry on my shoulder. I'm, I'll listen to you. And you're like, dude, get, get away from me. What are you, what are you doing? Uh, yeah, yeah, it yeah. definitely takes very different responses. And so, yeah, that's a huge issue there in that movie of why does God allow evil? Now, uh, you know, kind of as we wrap up, you know, I'm curious, uh, as you kind of research these movies and you worked and talked about this with your son, kind of, is there anything else that we maybe we haven't talked about that you kind of really thought was unique or stood out of maybe a connection that you made in the research that you maybe weren't expecting or something like that? Well, there's plenty of those in the movies, but one of the things that really struck us uh, was the last chapter where we write about the ultimate hero. And um, one of the things that really strikes us about Jesus is the fact that he never allows his good qualities to lead him into trouble. What do I mean by that? Um, he, he never uh, gets out of balance in any way. He's like, you know, apologists, we tend to be more truth than grace, right? Like, here's the truth. Come on. Why, why can't you see this? Right. But Jesus, yeah. he's 100 percent truth and 100 percent grace at the same time. I'm looking for the place in the book we cover this. It's in the last chapter. Um, and he's I'll just paraphrase it. He 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 is uh, completely mission focused, Ryan, but he's also people oriented. Like I'm mission focused all the time. I'll, I'll like steamroll people on the way to the mission, right? I'm not I'm not sensitive enough. He is um, uh, just somebody who has incredible confidence, at the, but at the same time, he's completely humble and approachable, hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, there's nobody in history that you know, in fiction or nonfiction, that has this perfect hundred percent. Even though these are almost contradictory values. Right. Confidence and humility, um, truth and grace, 
a mission folk focus yet people oriented. You know, he's got all this down, and he has it in a perfect way that could never have been invented. Uh, it's it's been put this way that um, Jesus is not an invented figure because nobody could invent a character like this hmm. and a character like this who who seems so authentic. And so when you look at Jesus, Jesus is the perfection of all of the heroes that we talk about in Hollywood heroes, whereas some of these heroes may have one or two of these perfections or one or two of these qualities, not to a perfect level. Jesus has them all and he is our sacrifice. Yeah. And so we aim all of these heroes at the ultimate hero, Jesus. And then we have the gospel at the end. We say, have you really accepted what this perfect hero has done for you. And if you haven't, why haven't you? So that's the goal of the book is not just to have a fun read. And hopefully it is a fun read. Most people on Amazon do like it. It's a fun read. But it's also to give people apologetic insights, to give them theological insights, to give them practical life lessons, and to point them ultimately to the Savior, Jesus. That's really the goal of the book. And hopefully, if your kid or your young person, or even your old person who loves movies, isn't as dialed in on Jesus, get them Hollywood heroes. Hopefully, it'll bring them closer. Yeah, and that's why I try to encourage parents and students. It's not just this Christian secular split of I only listen to Christian Mm -hmm. music and Christian movies, and I don't secular. It's like, hey, you, you actually find some amazing biblical truths and the gospel presented in ways in secular non-christian movies and it's amazing when mm-hmm. this happens and yeah you, you tie it all in here of you know the focus and wisdom and courage and humility and loyalty and discipline of all these different heroes put yeah. together into one figure now you do make an interesting comment here as well of uh, that we have this understanding of you know i will sacrifice for a loved one i will sacrifice for someone in my family someone i love and then we see these heroes not just sacrifice for their family or for their loved ones but sacrificing for strangers uh, and it's like wow how amazing is that is this per- you know they died for someone they don't even know and mm-hmm. then you make the point in your book jesus not it isn't just that he takes it like one step further and now he's the only person in history who's dying for his enemies yeah not not friendlies who he just doesn't know mm-hmm. and not his loved one but his enemy yes right? and, and how that, unique that, is that it is it's it's unlike any other here you see captain america and iron man maybe they'll sacrifice themselves for people they don't know but who's going to sacrifice himself for his enemies and jesus yeah. is the only one that does that he's the he's the perfection of all this yeah and so that's what we're aiming at with hollywood heroes yeah so as you mentioned there kind of uh, of who's reading it kind of um what would you say kind of is your target audience are you, are you looking uh in that very broad sense as you mentioned there of uh, of that is it more kind of a younger audience of who's kind of really watching this or are you trying to tie this into other aspects of, of apologetics and culture and conversations to where the, you're you're looking much bigger than just those who who love these sort of hollywood movies yeah, well, there are people like Natasha Crane who only saw one of the 19 <laughs> movies we recommended in the book. And she said, I love the book. I could still track with it. She says, I'm not a movie person, but my kids love these movies. So I know where I, what I'm going to do with the book. So you don't have to know the movies to read the book, but it, it is fun if you do. In fact, here's an idea. What we really were thinking, uh, Ryan, we were thinking that parents or youth group leaders, but particularly parents would go, Hey, movie night, Saturday night, invite your friends. We're going to read this chapter on Lord of the Rings, and then we're going to watch one of the movies, Hmm. right? And then discuss it afterwards. Next week, we'll do movie two, the week after that, three, right? Uh, Then we're going to do Iron Man. We'll start with the Iron Man movies, and we're going to read the chapter. You know, I mean, kids are going to love movie night, right? (laughs) (laughs) And then you can teach these theological, apologetic, and life lessons right to them and get them more interested in Jesus and Christianity. That's what we thought about. Now, anybody yeah. can read the book, but that's that's kind of the target we were thinking of. Yeah, awesome. Well, everybody, there you go. Hollywood heroes, Frank Turk, Zach Turek. Um, you saw it here and there's other... Uh, movies and heroes that is, are mentioned in the book, like Wonder Woman, that we did not get a chance to. So check that out. Pick up a copy. If that, uh, man, it, it was a fun read. You are right about that. Now, uh, Frank, uh, as we finish up, any kind of last words, uh, kind of other thoughts of other kind of ways in which people can follow crossexamine.org and kind of the work that you're doing and different speaking events that you're going to be uh, doing here around the country? Yeah, crossexamine.org has it all. Our YouTube channel has probably 2,000 videos now. We go to college campuses, high schools, and churches. 
and present the evidence that Christianity is true. For those of you who are watching on November 9th, and we're recording this tomorrow night, November 10th, we'll be at a college, Valdosta State in Georgia. If you missed it, it's live streamed. You can go to our YouTube channel and see it. This is where we go to college campuses, present the evidence that Christianity is true, and then we take questions. So if you fast forward, say a minute, an hour, 45 minutes into the thing, you'll probably start seeing Q&A. So we do a lot of that. We also have a podcast called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, a TV show called by the same name that you can see off our app, the cross-examined app, two words in the app store. It's also on Roku and uh, National Religious Broadcasters TV. So uh, we're, we're trying to reach people any way we can. Yep. Crossexamined.org is the website. Wonderful, Frank. Well, thank you so much for taking the time and chat with me today. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for having me on. God bless. Absolutely. God bless you too. All right, everybody, with that, we're going to close out our time together. But a few announcements before I go. First of all, I hope that you enjoyed this. I hope uh, we helped you think well about how to engage entertainment media and then allow that to point you back to Jesus, the gospel, and have productive conversations with those living in our culture. Next week, I'm going to be having a conversation with Elisa Childers on her new book, Live Your Truth and Other Lies, exposing popular deceptions that make us anxious, exhausted, and self-obsessed. So that is going to be available next week. If that's something that you're interested in, subscribe and don't miss that video. Video. Also like this, share it with those that you think might also be interested in our movie buffs and love these sort of conversations. With that, as we approach the end of the year, I do want to let you know, as the first year of Think Well Existing, it was jo uh, founded in June, we are coming up on the end of our first calendar year. And I would love to just take some time and chat with you, share what our vision is going into 2023 about the ministry that God is doing and give you an opportunity to partner, partner with us financially. So if you want more information, you can go to think-well.org. And if you're watching on YouTube in the description, below is a link that you can click and get more information on that or just shoot me an email ryan at think wellorg and i would love to connect with you and just share more about what god is doing through this ministry of training people to think well and engage the culture faithfully with that there's going to be more videos that pop up right here that can help you do that and other topics that we have covered here so see you next week for another conversation and thank you so much for joining us today continue to think well and think deeply about god christianity and jesus because they are worth thinking about. God bless everybody. See you next time.